Szanowni Państwo, dzień dobry, minęła godzina 17 i ja myślę, że to jest ten czas, abyśmy rozpoczęli nasze dzisiejsze wydarzenie. Czekamy nadal tutaj jeszcze na pozostałych gości. Dziś mamy jeden taki mały problem techniczny, który wystąpił, Szanowni Państwo, w związku z awarią naszych serwerów na uczelni i nie mieli Państwo zapewne dostępu do, do bezpośredniego linku do naszego dzisiejszego wydarzenia. Stało się to niestety przed dwiema godzinami, ale proszę, jeżeli możecie zaproponować taką, takie rozwiązanie dla swoich znajomych i dla wszystkich, którzy chcieliby uczestniczyć w naszym dzisiejszym spotkaniu, abyście, to, abyście udostępnili ten link i możliwość jakby uczestniczenia w tym wydarzeniu. Dzień dobry Państwu, serdecznie witamy z Akademii Pomorskiej w Słupsku. Nazywam się Mark Łukasik i jestem prorektorem do spraw rozwoju i współpracy. Bardzo miło mi Państwa widzieć i tutaj gościć na naszym kanale, na kanale YouTube, ale również przez platformę ClickMeeting. I jest mi niezmiernie miło przywitać Państwa na wydarzeniu, które inauguruje drugą edycję naszych wykładów w ramach projektu Akademia, Aktywna Akademia, wykładów na 5 plus, czyli wykładów ekspertów zagranicznych, których to gościmy w murach nasz, wirtualnych murach naszej uczelni. So let me introduce myself and I would like to say a good morning or good afternoon wherever you are in the world. Hello. Uh, it's really kind of you, all of you, to take part in our uh, broadcast, in our meeting today. Uh, well, my name is Mara Pukasik and I'm uh, the Vice Director for Development and cooperation at Pomeranian University in Swoops. Now, what I would like to say is that it's really a pleasure to see you here, to host you here in this meeting. And uh, we would like to uh, say that this meeting today, this event is the starting point of the second edition of our A plus lectures program. Now, this program is devoted to uh, having or to uh, hosting uh, world class experts that uh, will deliver lectures to the students, to the staff, but also to the general public interested in science and those who are really friends of uh, Pomeranian University in Swarovsk. So this is the program. This is what the program is all about. And uh, well, that's really just a very short introduction to the program itself. Więc to króciutkie takie wprowadzenie do tego naszego programu. Więcej Państwo mogą dowiedzieć się na pewno ze strony internetowej apsr.edu.pl. So if you're interested in more information, you can go to our website www.apsl.edu.pl and you find the English flag there and there is this English version. You can find out more about the program, about the university and about what we do as the universe, at, as a university in terms of public outreach. Um, a dziś specjalnie chciałbym e, przywitać w imieniu Biura do Spraw Rozwoju i Współpracy naszą prelegentkę, panią dr Monikę Kopacz, która wygłosi wykład pod tytułem Atmospheric Chemistry in COVID Area, Era. Przepraszam. I chciałbym tutaj jakby zaznaczyć bardzo mocno, że pani dr Monika Kopacz zgodziła się tutaj wystąpić przed państwem, reprezentując administrację niejako jedną z agent rządu Stanów Zjednoczonych, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Jest nam niezmiernie miło gościć tak znamienitą osobę z tak znamienitej instytucji w naszych wirtualnych murach. So let me introduce to you uh, Dr. Monika Kopacz, who is from National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration USA. And uh, uh, Monika, it's really a pleasure to have you here. I mean, it's re really honored that you agreed to stay with us, to, to deliver this lecture, to have to hold this talk and to share your ideas and knowledge with everyone here. And uh, we really cherish this cooperation and we're really looking forward to this event today. A więc, szanowni państwo, pozwólcie, otwieram dzisiejsze spotkanie. E Chciałbym zaprosić Państwa do zadawania pytań na czacie. Będziemy później je odczytywać na końcu naszego wydarzenia. Te pytania proszę kierować bezpośrednio jakby do Pani doktor Kopacz. Ja będę je później odczytywał, Szanowni Państwo, więc pełnię dzisiaj rolę moderatora, ale oczywiście wszelkie, wszelka, wszelki kontakt z nami jest również możliwy w ten sam sposób za pomocą platformy YouTube, na której obecnie już trwa transmisja. Tam również możecie Państwo zadać, zadawać potencjalne pytania. So, just an organizational thing. Uh, if you will, 
please ask, if you have any questions, please ask them using the chat box down there. And also uh, you can use the chat box through YouTube channel and you're all welcome to do so. I will then, at the end of the meeting, I will read out the questions. And so Dr. Kopach will be able to answer them once you have asked them. So let me then ask uh, Dr. Kopachru to take the floor uh, with the lecture, Atmospheric Chemistry in COVID era. Thank you so much for, uh, um, well, agreeing to this event, to uh, accepting our invitation. And let us start then. Dr. Kopacz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marek. The pleasure and honor is all mine. Um... In fact, I have uh, fond memories of, of coming to the university in, as an elementary student for some after-school uh, math activities. And I love math and being uh, among the college students was extra special. Um, in fact, yeah, I never really got into uh, atmospheric chemistry until graduate school. So um, yeah, it was, um, you, you'll hear more about it. But yeah, uh, thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, even if virtually. So I hope I can, um, interest you in this fascinating topic. I hope I can do it justice, but um, yeah, I guess I'll get right to it. Um, so the topic is atmospheric chemistry in the era of COVID-19, as, as uh, Marek mentioned. Um, and uh, I'm a program manager, AC4 program manager at NOAA, and I'll get to that, what that really means in, in a little bit. But um, yeah, first I think uh, I'll, I'll go to the next slide to show you some keywords. So um, I chose atmospheric chemistry for the title. But really, um, you might have seen other, you might have heard other keywords, which could work almost as well. So there's atmospheric chemistry, there's air quality. You know, we might often talk about it. Is air quality good or bad? Um, there's atmospheric composition. Actually, I tend to use that one. I find it more comprehensive for reasons I, I won't get to, into too much. Of course, we talk about air pollution. That's basically atmospheric chemistry. Some even, people even talk about air chemistry, Again, um, same idea. Um, sometimes we'll come across the phrase that's the air we breathe. And that, that's, again, that's, that's where chemistry happens. Um, that's what we're talking about, the, the top, uh, the, the lowermost uh, part of the atmosphere. And of course, we might come across um, greenhouse gases. That's also there in the mix uh, that we'll cover in atmospheric chemistry. And then there's this uh, other phrase <clears throat> that's a pretty recent short-lived climate pollutants um, that comes up a lot in the climate negotiations and, and when we talk about different greenhouse gases and other uh, things in the atmosphere that, that might um, influence climate. So we have all these keywords and uh, really it's all around atmospheric chemistry. It's, it's all in the same field of science, if you will. So what is the atmosphere made up of? Uh, so if we go back to our seventh or eighth grade chemistry, uh, we learned that 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen, 21% of the atmosphere is oxygen, and then there's that 1% that's in trace gases and aerosols, and that is really what we're talking about here. This 1% of the atmosphere, this is where all the action happens, if you will. Um, so you might think that's small, um, and, and um, yes, that is small, but uh, like any... Uh, <laughs> For comparison, we can think of what happens to our bodies if we take, you know, a little, a uh, few grams of poison. I guess that would be kind of, you know, obviously influence uh, many pounds of flesh that we are. So uh, not that necessarily all that 1% is as bad. There's a lot of water vapor, for example, in that 1%. But it just gives you an idea of how much this 1% of the atmosphere can influence um, uh, really uh, everything that's happening in the atmosphere. Um, and one thing I want to point out is that um, everything that, as I mentioned, everything that really happens in the atmosphere is in that 1%. And um, as we can see, oxygen is just there. Uh, a lot of times we think of trees maybe as producing oxygen, and they do. They, that's exactly what they do when they grow. But they don't really influence the oxygen. There, there are some small changes, but really oxygen is there already. So it's really for all the other reasons, for example, we would um, definitely want to have trees in the world and um, things like that. So just to give you an idea of what that 1% really consists of, um, just you probably have heard of carbon dioxide, right? The, the major greenhouse gas and uh, concentration of that uh, at the bottom here we have is uh, currently about 400 ppm. That's, that's how we talk about it. And that, what that means is 400 parts per million, which translates to 0.04% of the whole atmosphere. 
So that gives you an idea that this very abundant carbon dioxide gas that, that we talk about so much and it does so much to the atmosphere um, is just for fourth of a, a hundredth of a percent uh, of the whole atmosphere. So what else is there? So when we talk about trace gases and aerosols, and, and I do separate the gases from the aerosols, which a lot of them are particles. Uh, so we might have heard us talk about the filters and in, in, um, in, in the air purifiers, and you see the things um, accumulating there. Those would be the more of the particles. Uh, you might have heard about COVID spreading through aerosol droplets. That, that's the aerosol droplets that we're talking about here. So they tend to be particles unlike um, other gases, which are just gases. So. Some of the gases, the main gases uh, that we would study in atmospheric chemistry are ozone. And here uh, I'd like to point out there's three kinds of ozone, still same molecule, but depending on where they are in the atmosphere, they do different things. So there's a, we call it a good, bad and ugly ozone. The good ozone um, is in the stratosphere. So that's the um, part of the atmosphere that's just above the air we breathe, if you will. If, you, if you're taking an airplane across uh, an ocean, uh, those really long distance planes, you might get to the to the stratosphere tiny little bit, almost there at 10 kilometers or so. Um, and, and that's where the good ozone lives, the, the ozone layer that protects us from too much radiation. Then there's the bad ozone, uh, which is just below that, um, really above our heads, if you will, way above our heads, a few kilometers, maybe five or so, five to eight. And that's when ozone is a greenhouse gas because it is a greenhouse gas. But that's this is this is where it really acts as a greenhouse gas. And there's ozone close to the surface, the ozone that that we breathe in. Um, that's you know air pollution a lot and, and the cities as well, especially. And that's that's the really harm, harmful effects we that we um, get from those from that ozone. Nitrogen dioxides are also um, very abundant, uh, very um, much the main trace gases. Um, they come out of the tailpipes of the cars. So this is something that the catalytic converters are supposed to at least minimize, if not completely get rid of, but they're still out there. So if we see nitrogen oxides, that's basically, we see cars on the road. Um, there's carbon monoxide um, that's uh, actually going down. It used to be a bigger problem, especially in houses, if, if in, in um, not so well functioning stoves and things like that. It's, it's a, comes from incomplete combustion. So if things don't burn well, if you will, we get carbon monoxide. Some of our houses um, even have carbon monoxide detectors these days. Uh, but in, in the atmosphere, we see it and, and it does things, but not at the level that it would be harmful necessarily directly to us. But it's still something definitely you, you study a lot. It's, it's a good tracer of pollution. So if we want to see how pollution travels around the world, we might look at carbon monoxide. Actually, I did my PhD mostly with um, that uh, compound. And then, of course, again, we have carbon dioxide, the, the major, the main greenhouse gas. And then we have methane. Um, you um, I hear about methane from um, natural gas um, in, in our stove. So that's that's the greenhouse gas, but also um, a major um, hydrocarbon. And we'll talk about hydrocarbons later. And there's sulfur dioxide. Um, it comes up a lot from um, coal combustion and from... Um, power plants uh, and also from volcanoes. So um, a lot of uh, sulfur dioxide comes from volcanoes and, and can travel um, long distances as well. Then there's CFCs and HFCs. Um, I don't want to throw too many acronyms without defining them, but I think uh, maybe we can. We don't need to go too much into them. These are the chlorofluorocarbons and their replacements, um, which are um, the first ones, CFCs, are harmful to the ozone layer, and this, they are responsible for the ozone hole that we've had the past few decades. And HFCs are their immediate replacements that now we know are very strong greenhouse gases. So that's, again, uh, part of the atmospheric chemistry field of study, and, and, um, and they're still very important even if they're decreasing. We still need to um, monitor them as well. And of course, there's aerosols, all kinds of complicated chemistry and physical property, physical processes go into um, emissions and formation of aerosols. So they're abundant. Uh, they're very um, unknown. A lot of them, we know they're harmful to uh, human health, but we can't tell which compounds exactly. So that is a very, very active um, area of studies, especially the aerosols that are formed from other gases and, and aerosols. 
and we call them secondary organic aerosols, especially SOA. And there's thousands more compounds that uh, atmospheric chemists um, study, um, trace, um, and monitor, um, try to reproduce in the labs and things like that. So uh, we won't go into too many details of that, but I just want to give you an, an idea of what kind of compounds we're talking about. Some are familiar, some might not be. Um, so um, I thought it'd be nice to have it and not just a laundry list of compounds, but just to put them in perspective of how how they just figure into into our lives. And let's see if I have a pointer here. Uh, let's see, right. So we have, um, this is just a depiction of basically our world. And you see a lot of processes happening here in the atmosphere. So for example, we have biomass burning, you know, anything from uh, agriculture burning, um, forest burning, uh, that obviously produces smoke and that smoke uh, can do a lot of things, uh, including um, travel long distances, uh, affect human health, uh, produce clouds, um, make more rain, less rain, uh, depending on how things happen. Um, there's uh, this thing called biogenics. This is the compounds that are emitted directly by trees, not, not burning trees, just, just standing there and depending on the temperature that's in the air. So those are um, really not so well studied, uh, but are, are a very active area of, uh, of research. Then there's the urban areas that have their own unique um, set of um, chemicals that, that are in the air, that are formed, that are emitted. Um, of course, there's air traffic. Uh, airplanes are a big source of emissions. And um, where they emitted uh, is also very important. So that, that makes them sort of unique. And of course, we have industry, residential energy sectors of, of our industries or our lives that produce all kinds of chemicals that do all kinds of different things in the atmosphere, go through a lot of chemistry. The mobile sector here uh, represents the cars, but also uh, but both cars, you know, passenger cars and um, uh, trucks, any commercial traffic that we have. And here, uh, just a few, few more compounds listed. I don't think I covered all of them, but basically this is where chemistry happens. And um, there's ozone and PM 2.5, PM 2.5 is basically aerosols. So these are the two key pollutants, the secondary pollutants, because they're not emitted. They're formed in the atmosphere from other chemistry that we really track for air quality impacts. And of course, all kinds of things can happen, not just chemi chemically, but also uh, physically. So um, aerosols from clouds. In fact, um, there's no clouds without aerosols. That's, that's very rare. Uh, so if you have perfectly clean air, which I guess is not really possible, you would not even get clouds. So definitely um, yeah, there, what can happen is, is uh, cloud scavenging, basically. Um, those pollutants, um, especially the aerosols, can form clouds. And then uh, right now, that's how the atmosphere gets clean, basically. Um, so let's see, what, what does air pollution look like? Um, historically, uh, it was quite easy to see it, right? So there's really some extreme examples from the past. This is uh, Los Angeles in 1948, uh, really severe air pollution there. And of course there was a famous uh, uh, London fog, which wasn't a fog, was um, just really extreme air pollution that killed a lot of people. This was, you know, back in 1950s. And um, that fortunately, got cleaned up, definitely. The, those farms were recognized and, and their policies put in place. And, and uh, this is not no longer what London or Los Angeles look, look like. Um, these days, actually, the poster children for uh, air pollution, if you will, are mostly um, city, big cities in, in Asia, particularly China, especially as, as of about 20 years ago. Uh, so the pictures we see in the media um, uh, making headlines are Beijing, Peking, uh, and other uh, parts of, of um, East Asia, but also uh, India, definitely. A lot of uh, cities in India have their own um, set of set of air pollution challenges, especially Delhi. So again, these are headlines that, that, that we see for air pollution these days. Um, and of course, um, the picture isn't exactly clear even in the US as well, despite all the progress that has been made, uh, a factor of few, um, in fact, in Los Angeles, uh, for example, it was um, that the air got cleaned. 
but there's still problems and and things like wildfires are still contributing to a lot of air quality issues um seasonally but still that that's definitely severe enough to cause some health issues so these are some headlines from um from the us for example the one on the left is from colorado there's definitely a lot of seasonal fires there and on the right we see a picture sort of with and without smoke in the national park. And that's a big concern. A lot of people like to go to national parks expecting beautiful, clean nature. And that is not often what they get. In fact, I think this year, the, some of the parks were closed in California because of the smoke um, that was coming there. So even if it's not fire that you're experiencing, you could still be very much affected by the smoke um, downwind. So we still see these headlines. In fact, I think uh, in Greece and, and Europe had uh, big problems these year, this year. With fires as well and unlike you know polluting cars or, or maybe dirty power plants you could say uh wildfires are not going away fire is definitely an integral part of um forest ecosystem so that is something that people will have to live with uh people are moving closer to the fire prone areas which i really see is not helping um the these issues so that's something that that will be with us for well, forever, um, and, and we'll we'll have to figure out how to how to mitigate the um, the impacts from smoke on our health. So um, now I just want to switch a little bit to um, how do we study atmospheric chemistry? We obviously covered the problems, and uh, if we do want to study it, and, and we obviously have studied it, how how do we do that? Um, so one way is through laboratory measurements, um, either capturing air outside and bringing it into the lab to analyze it, or, or even just making some, um, some experiments directly in the lab, producing different particles, see what the properties are, things like that. Another way is uh, ground-based monitors. So we have a picture here of one of the stations that NOAA has uh, measuring, uh, monitoring, in fact, um, air quality or, or greenhouse gases in different parts of the world. So that can be done continuously, but in one spot. Another complementary way is through aircraft measurements. Um, one can put a lot of instruments on the plane. And of course, the beauty of that is that you can go to different places, but you cannot do it uh, continuously. So that's good for episodic, um, we call them field campaigns. So you uh, plan to measure around New York City, for example, and you uh, fly around and get an idea of different parts of the region um, or even the country. And then, of course, we have computer models. So uh, that's actually my own background, uh, writing code um, to, to simulate how the atmosphere would look like in different kinds of um, scenarios with the missions or bigger and uh, putting our understanding in what the processes are and then seeing if we can simulate what we see in the atmosphere. And um, the latest greatest, uh, I could say, uh, is, is the satellites as well. I think those are increasingly more useful uh, for um, atmospheric chemistry studies. And I definitely want to point out that all types of this research is undertaking at NOAA. So now actually I'll get to a little bit about NOAA, I believe. Yes, yeah, so what is NOAA? Um, um, Monica already mentioned this is part of the US government and in fact it is. Uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is what the acronym stands for. And it is a mission driven agency uh, of the US government, which means that um, obviously we need curiosity-driven research, but this is really um, where we have a mission, specific mission, so we don't just um, do whatever the scientists um, feel like doing today, if you will. So the mission of NOAA is to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, oceans, and coasts, to share that knowledge and information with others, and to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystem resources. And you, if you think you haven't really heard about NOAA much, and I'm sad to say a lot of people, even around me, um, uh, have trouble identifying that acronym. I uh, went to work better on my our marketing, I suppose. Um, let me assure you that you definitely are, are very aware of what NOAA does. So the two graphs at the bottom I have uh, really, I think, illustrate that. So. If we think of greenhouse gases, if we think of carbon dioxide, CO2, the major greenhouse gas, and if you ever hear these days, CO2 is this much. These days, I think it's 413 ppm, for example. This is an answer that NOAA provides. This is the monitoring that NOAA does for the whole world through uh, World Meteorological um, Organization and other uh, UN bodies. 
this, this is what NOAA is responsible for. In fact, this is the Global Monitoring Laboratory, uh, which is part of NOAA that does this monitoring. Uh, so that's the graph on the right, uh, on the left. Um, and then that's CO2, so it's going up, up, and up, and abated. On the right, um, it's another very important, one of many very important jobs that NOAA has, is um, stratospheric ozone recovery monitoring. So um, you might have heard about ozone hole, you know, that's why we need sunscreen more than we did when, when uh, we were little, at least when I was little, um, because um, there were these CFCs that um, these compounds that destroyed the atmosphere. There was a Nobel Prize awarded for figuring out that chemistry. And then um, all the countries got together, realized that's a global problem, global environmental problem that we need to fix. And they did. Um, they had a Montreal protocol that ev all the countries ratified. Uh, I forget exact date, somewhere in the 90s and 92 maybe. And um, the compounds that, that caused the problem were banned. And those compounds were everywhere, right? CFCs were in fridges, in cars, in aerosols, sprays, and all the cans, hairsprays, all that. Um, they, they were pretty ubiquitous. And, and somehow the world managed to fix it. So actually this figure I got just yesterday morning from the laboratory itself, from, uh, from um, the scientist there, Brian Johnson, who's responsible for, uh, for recording what is the ozone um, these days. Because um, I wanted to get the, the latest figure because there I hope that we can that I can make this figure as as um, as hopeful as it can be. Because uh, if you see the ozone, um, just the main uh, the dark line going down, um, it, yeah, this is the ozone hole. This is the minimum of ozone uh, that we had in the stratosphere. But if I if We'd like to believe that it's recovering. Of course, it's hard to tell yet. Uh, I don't know that we have enough data. Obviously, there's interannual variability. One year it's up, one year it's down. So it's still going up and down. It's not a straight line. Um, but there is hopeful message. That's definitely not, doesn't look like it's decreasing. And, and this is really, um, when we think of our other environmental change, challenges these days, especially with um, climate change, uh, I think this provides really a hopeful message that the world has face challenges, a global uh, environmental challenges, and has done something about it. Um, so I think that's a very helpful message there. Um, so a little bit more about NOAA, and I realized that seeing an organizational chart in the presentation is, is uh, rarely fun, but bear with me, I have a point here. So NOAA, uh, especially at the, um, for atmospheric composition purposes, atmospheric chemistry purposes, is made up of five parts. I see the last two parts don't show up too well, but that's okay. We don't need to talk about them maybe. So one branch, and again, acronyms that maybe we don't need to get into is research, research branch of NOAA. Then we have the weather. Um, this is where all the weather forecast comes from uh, for the US and the satellite side, which provides the mostly weather satellites for NOAA. And in the research side where, where I am, uh, we have laboratories. Uh, this is where government scientists do science uh, day to day. Uh, so we have, this is the um, different acronyms for them. But then we also have programs. Um, I am in the climate program office. That's my office. And this is my program under it. And um, it, we often don't get into, um, don't get to talk about the programs because obviously the scientists do the science. But um, I would argue that programs are also important because we do make science happen, if you will. We make the connection. We bring in the experts from the outside uh, of NOAA, academic experts that really um, help uh, fulfill NOAA mission. We steer science in, in the direction where we see it, it going in the future. We see the needs. Uh, uh, we coordinate with other uh, government agencies, other countries. Uh, we um, see basically who does what and what kind of connections we can make. So um, that, that's basically my job. I am no longer a, a working scientist. I'm a program manager now, and that, that is basically my job. And I think I might have another slide about, yeah, this, this is basically my program. Um, AC4, which stands for Atmospheric Chemistry, Carbon Cycle, and Climate. Um, and it's a competitive research program. I manage a portfolio of multi-year projects uh, with, with the goal of determining the processes governing atmospheric concentrations of trace gases and aerosols in the context of Earth's system. So basically, atmospheric chemistry. And 
we'd like to think that the AC4 program strengthens, extends, and complements NOAA laboratory efforts with external and cross line office engagement, line offices being the parts of NOAA. So that really is the, the core here of, of, uh, of this, what my day job is to really bring the scientists together, um, steer them in the direction where um, where the science is going, where the need, the societal needs are going, are, are, um, are identified by the government and other agencies, other entities and um, other things that are going on in the world. So I think I have some examples of that. Um, uh, but first, I think I want to get into uh, history. Uh, hope uh, you don't mind a little back and forth. So um, the AC4 program is fairly new, um, but I do want to just give you an idea of how um, how new the whole field is, uh, and it really mirrors how um, how old NOAA is as well. It's actually a pretty new field, uh, atmospheric chemistry. Uh, it's just a few decades old. It's amazing what we did not know 50 years ago, um, even 20 years ago. It's uh, even a few years ago for some really groundbreaking and latest discoveries. But um, it really all started um, in earnest in the 60s with the first ground observatories and CO2 network, those first um, data points for carbon dioxide. No one knew where they were going, but somehow it seemed like something to measure. Um, now we have this beautiful record and that started in 1960s. 1970s and when people started noticing the ozone uh, in the stratosphere and potentially a hole uh, forming there towards the end of the decade. In the 80s is when we start, first started getting the uh, chemistry models. So first global models, first um, programs, uh, computer programs that, that could help us simulate uh, what's in the atmosphere. In the 90s, it was a bit of a golden era and, and the first uh, really foray into airborne field experiments. It was really exciting times for just Let's take the plane and, and fly over Atlantic and see what's there. We had no idea. Um, there were no satellites around then. Um, there were no measuring stations in the middle of the uh, ocean, especially. So people would just take the plane and go see what's there. Is there ozone? We don't know. Um, so that was a uh, really exciting times. And I think as we got into the 21st century, we realized that what a group effort things are. And then really the competitive research, bringing everyone together and the NOAA partners. Uh, it's really important. That's that's what my um, program's job is, and of course the satellites uh, really um, really arrived uh, in the last twenty years uh, in earnest for atmospheric chemistry, and that is really uh, we're entering the golden era for that as well, for sure. And I'll get a little bit into that uh, later on. I want to make sure that I don't spend too much time um, here, and I do get to cover it. So I'll just um, go briefly through the, some of the things that AC4 has um, is involved in. Um, so even though it's an atmospheric chemistry program, there's only certain parts of uh, the this broad field that we can cover. So some of the science topic that program has been involved in is um, nitrogen cycle. Uh, this is the cycling of different forms of nitrogen, different compounds. Uh, we do touch on atmospheric pollution from space. This is where we do satellite data. Uh, through some modeling and data simulation um, and observations that NOAA has, we work on CO2 fluxes. Uh, we uh, focus on urban atmosphere and more on that later, uh, what that means. Uh, we recently spent uh, well, a lot of uh, time and effort and, and funding on emissions and chemistry of wildfires. That's obviously a big problem um, in the in US, um, affecting a lot of lives. So uh, that was a big uh, focus. And also there was this um, oil and gas emissions. Uh, I, I don't know if you recall a few years ago, especially there was huge increase in oil and gas production around the world actually. And that unfortunately came with a lot of leakages of methane and other compounds. And that was causing some problems um, and, and just increasing methane um, around the world, which is obviously a greenhouse gas. And some of the tools that, that get into the science that AC4 supports are field campaigns where we, um, take an aircraft and, and fly to make measurements uh, process and earth system modeling. So anything from a small uh, box model to a big global model and atmospheric monitoring, really leveraging this uh, amazing data set that NOAA is collecting through decades now. Um, and I think I might actually skip the next slide. Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this urban atmosphere, what we mean by this, because I do want to point out one important thing that the latest greatest research in that is the um, realization that volatile consumer products, we call them VCPs, are really making a huge difference, not just inside our houses, but 
outside in the atmosphere, a global atmosphere as well. So things, products that we use every day are really causing um, a lot of chemistry to happen and that potentially forms things like ozone, which are obviously harmful to human health. And that actually happens um, as uh, emissions from cars and other traditional sources are going down. So our success uh, outside um, in the outside world is actually being offset by this increasing emissions inside the house. So I'll just um, I'll just say this much and maybe even skip the next slide. So let's just get to COVID. Um, so what happened? What happened to air pollution when COVID arrived? So some of the headlines you might have seen are, are, are pictures like this. So on the left, we have a picture of uh, I believe this gate of India um, in where we see a typically polluted uh, picture of the atmosphere became clear skies. Uh, I think um, some of us uh, might have even noticed that in our day-to-day -day life that you know nature came back, right? Um, in the atmosphere, also animals and other things like that. So everything stopped, right? On the right, we see traffic in Boston, Boston where I'm sitting. Uh, so if we look at daily vehicle counts, we see that around mid-March of last year, things just dropped off. Like I think something like 50% at least uh, traffic just went down. And of course, traffic going down means that there's um, less air pollution, less um, particles, uh, less gases being emitted. Um, we still got our food and had to go places uh, when we needed to. But uh, so it wasn't, we didn't go down to zero, but it really dropped off significantly. So for some, so obviously the, the reasons were, were tragic and they still are, but in terms of the science <laughs> of the atmosphere, uh, especially for somebody like me who's coming from modeling and I've turned off cars in, in the model, but that's something you can only do in a model. But all of a sudden, here was this uh, somewhat natural experiment that was just fascinating. Um, from the scientific point of view. So if I go to the next slide, um, I'll get to um, say a little bit about what we did about it because it was a very unique but very urgent opportunity to make some measurements. So we at NOAA um, got to it right away. Of course, the tricky thing was that we were not really allowed to. So the question is, if we want to take measurements, who can do that? Um, who can uh, get into their lab? Um, so there were NOAA scientists. In fact, the next slide might show it even more. The NOAA scientists devised this uh, COVID air quality study. So a lot of these scientists are, are located in Boulder, Colorado, which might not be the most ideal place to look at the big signal of changing um, air tra uh, transport tra uh, emissions, for example. So um, this is when and um, the AC4 management, where, where I, I got to scratch my head, who can make those measurements? Uh, who are the scientists we're working with? And incidentally, we were about to start projects in other cities. Interesting, very interesting coincidence. And, and those places were New York City, Atlanta, Missoula, Montana, uh, Los Angeles, and Salt Lake City. And um, they nicely span all kinds of um, types of cities, big cities, small cities, Atlanta being surrounded by trees, um, Los Angeles being more in a um, Mediterranean climate, uh, obviously New York City being a big city with the big signal and very affected by uh, all the closures last year. So it was a unique opportunity, but uh, it, it was quite a scramble. We you know, had to figure out who can do whatever they could do given the lockdown, um, who could have access to the to their instruments. Uh, I think in the NOAA lab in Boulder, um, it was the deputy director who just had one person access to the lab, had to set up all the instruments and then monitor it. So, um, so it, it, it was tough, but it, it was it was done. It was a kind of nice uh, group collaboration with different parts of the lab. Um, and what this allowed us to do is, uh, looking at, at the notes on the slides here, is that we could um, assess the changes in U.S. emission sources. So really separated because it was really the passenger transport that went away. The trucks were still on the road. Right, we're still getting our food and other things that we needed, uh, but we could um, separate these different sources, which was a very unique um, situation. And also, um, we wonder if that's a glimpse of a potential future of urban air quality. 
what if we had all electric car, for example? Is this what we could be seeing? Um, I, the same as with the lockdown. That's one thing we were definitely wondering. So if we looked at satellite data, right? So how much was was the decrease? So this is satellite actually from, from um, Eastern China, in case you can't tell <laughs> right away from the map <laughs> which part of the world you, we're looking at here. So the top row is really 2020 and the bottom row is 2019. And this is um, a satellite data of NO2, nitrogen dioxide. And what you see here uh, in chronological order is uh, January, um, see, this is around Beijing. Uh, this is um, big, uh, well, this is Shanghai here, and, and there's a lot of, um, not just Beijing, but lots of activity, industrial activity as well. So you see emissions going down and, and really staying down until April. Um, and versus in 2019, and a more typical year, you see these the pollution going down, there's a seasonality to it. But then it's going back up in March, which we didn't quite see. Uh, you see the difference between the two years. Um, one thing that I want to point out is that CO2 emissions and concentration didn't decrease as dramatically. And it's a much more scientific and a complicated scientific problem. So uh, that's, I won't get into too much details of that, but, but I do want to mention that for CO2, the picture looks a little different. NO2 is probably the clearest picture of what happened, things dropped off. Um, so another thing I want to point out, this is actually the hot off the press. It's so hot off the press uh, paper that it's not actually even in press. It's in, in discussions, what we call. Um, but I do want, it's a good example for what happened to ozone. Ozone is a complicated story because it's a nonlinear response, uh, has a nonlinear response to emission reduction. So um, the, the graph here on the, on the, that we see, I don't want to get into too many details, but it's basically um, uh, a recipe of how ozone is formed. So the y-axis is, is NO2, NOx, really, and then x-axis is VOC, so hydrocarbons that we need to produce ozone. Those two and really sunlight is what we need. And depending on the ratio of the two, we might form more ozone or less ozone. So um, this study that I'm, I'm citing here that, that's in review right now, it really was the first, as they say, comprehensive study integrating all kinds of measurements uh, over Europe to look at emission reductions during spring 2020. And they looked at enhancement of ozone. So it's a complicated picture. So uh, what this shows, uh, ozone decreases if we have, um, if we decrease emissions and we have this NOx limited regime, and then um, ozone increases if we have this VOC limited regime and we um, decrease NOx. I'm not sure if I'm even explaining this correctly, but if we just go to the next slide, you see the figure um, that really shows um, a, almost a mixed message. So this is a figure from that, from that paper and review that, that shows the ozone changes. So red being increased, blue being decreased. Um, and those changes uh, here in this figure are, are isolated to be due only to the lockdown. So they remove the effect of meteorological conditions because also depending on what the winds and temperature are doing, you could see differences. And it was a complicated spring that way. Um, so given uh, different satellites, um, this is the picture we get uh, on the top left. So you see a lot of reduction. Then we see a smaller reduction on top right uh, using in situ data. So these are ground monitoring um, stations. And then the bottom um, row shows the model simulation. So based on what we know, we, we think this is what happened. So we see slight enhancement here and there. So it's a very, very complicated picture uh, of what was happening to ozone. That one that we really still not sure that we understand. Um, so Given all this, when we look at any future plans, right? So this is uh, just switching, switching back to the my AC4 program. Is and, and last year we had now this year 2021 we had this call for proposals. This is how the program works. We receive proposals and then we start projects depending on how well they review. Um, we have this project coming up. It's called Aroma Emission Atmospheric Emissions and Reactions Over Observed from Mega Cities and Marine Areas. For our purposes here is basically we will be uh, measuring around New York City uh, with an aircraft into spring summer 2023 so that's the plan um actually the plan was supposed to be for this year uh, but obviously it was postponed due, due to COVID. but even as we're planning this for 2023 wonder 
will this still be COVID relevant? Will we still see the effects of, of the lockdowns, the changing emissions, the changing chemistry, or would it, will it just be the whatever happens after COVID? It, it's it's still on our minds as we plan this long-term um, research agenda. So one thing, uh, looking to the future, I wanted to definitely talk about because it's uh, near and dear to my heart is the satellites. So even as we're planning future satellites, and it's definitely a plan, um, satellites take a long time to plan. This is planned for the 2030s, but it's a very exciting plan that NOAA has. It's a, um, it's a geoexo constellation. It's a constellation of geostationary satellites. Um, geostationary being satellites that orbit with the Earth, so they always look at the same part of the Earth. And um, so far, mostly we had observations from polar orbiting satellites, so just kind of pass by once a day, versus these will give us measurements almost constantly throughout the day, especially when we have sunlight. Um, and the exciting thing is that we really see hour by hour how things change, and as we saw, I didn't really show it, but during COVID, we really looked at those satellites. When things were happening, we were saying, what are the satellites saying? What are, what are they showing? Uh, can we see the reductions? What was it today? What was it to, tomorrow, uh, yesterday? Um, so they really relied on this and um, just having this uh, coming up in the pipeline um, with some hourly resolution will just be really game changing. Um, it's going to be the first time that NOAA will have this kind of measurements. And I should mention the European plans are kind of parallel. So uh, hopefully we'll have uh, this over US, um, another set of uh, satellites like this over Europe and actually over Korea, they're already flying. And, and this constellation of satellites will have actually six measure, six instruments. So um, obviously I spend a lot of my time and energy on the atmospheric composition instrument, which isn't a greatly named because this Im imager and the sounder instruments are also very um, useful for atmospheric chemistry measurements. But also we'll have lightning mapper, uh, which you know shows us maps of lightning uh, to predict uh, severe weather, like uh, uh, you might be having now, although hopefully no lightning. Um, and day and night imagery, if you ever see the night sky, beautiful pictures, that, that's basically that. And a new instrument, another a new instrument is ocean color. Um, I know a lot of ocean um, scientists are very excited about this. Um, so I think that uh, as I'm getting basically towards the end, um, I just want to summarize some lessons that we're learning from the COVID-19 era. So given all that happened and that we were able to measure and we're still analyzing, um, all these lockdowns, obviously, especially helped us quantify air pollution contribution from transportation sector. And this was mostly passenger transport, since obviously the trucks were still on the road delivering our goods. Um, we also learned that there was a small change in CO2. Here we were, you know, sitting all at home, most of us sitting at home, not venturing out, not doing anything, maybe probably not driving either. But we only see a small change in CO2. So we really learned how long way we have to go for climate change mitigation. This is really um, not the full picture of what we need to do. We need some um, serious reduction through other ways. Um, another thing that we learn is um, that reducing pollution is complicated. Uh, we've done some easy things in the, in the past. Uh, well, um, obviously nothing was easy, but now they seem easy by comparison. But you know those pictures from London and uh, Los Angeles, um, those really severe pollution. We know how to take care of that. So we know uh, what to do, how to reduce that air pollution when it's that severe. But at this point, where we think the air is pretty clean, but we still see uh, very big health effects from from air pollution, it's getting more complicated. Um, getting efficient cars, obviously no more lead in the gasoline, we have catalytic converters, and still somehow, you know, you know, the products that we have in our households are an issue, and that's really complicated, complicating the picture, and, and things that we can do. Um, and another thing that we learn is that um, the satellites can really help us provide timely information. I mean, it's great to have those measuring stations around the world, Obviously, it's good every now and then to hop on a plane, a research plane, and measure things in, in great detail. But day to day, hour by hour, it's great to have these satellites um, staring down and providing information whenever we need it in a very timely way. So these are some lessons. Uh, I didn't actually get into the uh, role of atmospheric chemists in 
an actual um, spread of COVID-19. I guess that's another uh, topic that's that's different, but also something that atmospheric chemists uh, contributed during the uh, past 18 months or so. Um, but I think I'd like to just leave on this somewhat um, positive note, hopefully, is that uh, we think of COVID happening, obviously it's still happening, still with us, and we're hoping that it ends. But uh, one thing that we're already starting to see is that it might have a pretty lasting impact for atmospheric chemistry, that is, because um, the remote work might be keeping um, still uh, some cities air cleaner. This is a latest research actually just came out uh, not long ago by my colleague Shabba Kontragunta and her um, colleagues. Uh, it, it shows that even though work has resumed, uh, we're going to school, um, doing some travel, maybe go to concert, things like that. But uh, the re emissions reductions are still visible, still quantifiable up to 20% in some cases, because um, people are still working from home, we're like realizing a lot can be done from home. Um, so I think with that, I'm just going to end and just thank you very much for the attention. Again, it's it's a, it's a great honor to to be able to share this fascinating topic with you, hopefully, <laughs> in, in a presentable way. Thank you. Back to you, Mark. Hey, Monica. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, it's been very interesting talk and uh, we have some uh, questions pouring in. I have some as well, if you if you don't mind. But I mean, you have to excuse me. I mean, I was so thrilled to have you here. That I've forgot really to introduce you really to the public so i'm really sorry i will do that do this now uh so uh let me say that uh well the expert today is monica kopach a phd and a program manager of a competitive research program at the um national oceanic and atmospheric administration part part of the u.s government as we already talked about um, well, the scope of the research, the program supports spans short-lived air pollutants and long-lived greenhouse gases. Now, prior to joining NOAA, uh, Dr. Kopac conducted research on several aspects of atmospheric chemistry and published science articles, mostly on air pollution modeling using satellite data. Now, she received her undergraduate degree from Columbia University and master's and doctoral degrees from Harvard University, all in applied mathematics. So. Monica, thank you so much for, uh, again, for being with us and uh, for delivering this beautiful lecture today. Uh, we have some questions, and there is this first question that I can see from Rob. Uh, do we have to fear about our lives during, uh, due to changes in atmosphere? That's the question that probably you can try yeah, to okay. answer. Thank you. Let me break that down to two parts. Um, do the changes of, in the atmosphere affect our health? Yes. In fact, I think even United Nations, uh, one of the branches, by many reports will tell us that air pollution is one of the leading causes of premature mortality in the world, uh, especially in young kids, uh, elderly, other vulnerable populations. But do we have to fear? I don't know if that's the question I can answer. Um, there's a lot of things that if you think too hard, <laughs> it will be scary. Uh, it, it's, it's definitely a cost benefit analysis, even in things like deciding where to live um, and, and which areas are affected by air pollution, which areas are affected by climate change, things like that. So uh, I think the fear is up to the individual, but uh, the effect um, definitely is there. Is it bigger than other? Um, aspects of our lives we consider. Uh, I, again, that's not something I can answer, but I think that the two could be separate because, um, you know, even crossing the street is dangerous when you think about it. Okay, thank you, Monica. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Anna coming in. Is NOAA issuing some sort of recommendations based on the research for the government that can be the basis for tighter or better legislature and uh, well, and also a big thank you in advance for the great lecture, Monica. Um, that's actually a very good question. Uh, I didn't really get into different parts of the US government, but one thing that NOAA uh, often needs to clarify and, and definitely needs to be clear about is that um, it does science, especially for atmospheric chemistry. I think in the fisheries area, there's some regulatory authority, 
But in terms of everything else, especially atmospheric and oceanic science, we do science where we we're, we're, we're call ourselves the honest broker. We won't tell you what to do. We will not prescribe any policies. We will not make any recommendations. But we will monitor what's in the atmosphere. We will assess what it is. Maybe we'll look out for new things that might be a threat. But again, this is just um, you know oil and gas production is increasing. Let's let's see what that means for the atmosphere without any prescription for policy or anything. That's actually there's another part of the U.S. government called Environmental Protection Agency (EPA) uh, that. Uh, part of the government actually does have the authority to regulate things based on the laws that are passed, like Clean Air Act, things that are really some of the greatest legislature um, in in, um, in in the country, cleaning up the air. That's that that was done with that um, law that was passed, uh, the Clean Air Act, and it's EPA, the other part of the government that will actually enforce it. It will fine the states if they exceed um, uh, the standards. Um, so that that's that part of the government. We obviously work together. EPA um, will see what measurements NOAA takes and, and we'll see what they can do based on that. But that's the regulation and any recommendations for policy, that's EPA. That's not NOAA. So thank you for that question. It's always good to clarify that. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. There is a big thank you from Rob for the uh, interesting lecture, as you can see, and also uh, some of the big thank, thank you coming in through uh, YouTube. Uh, also, a big thank you from, from Monica as well, Monica Niska, uh, well, uh, a researcher from our university as well. Now, please ask your questions using chat. We have a few minutes left, and maybe I may have a question if you don't mind, Monica. Is there any level of uh, CO2 in terms of the PPM, I mean, if you can model it, uh, that will bring irreversible changes to climate? Or is this notion valid at all that we can have irreversible changes? Yeah, I don't know if we know enough. Um, depending how many steps you want to take CO2 increase to, right? If you uh, connect CO2 increase to changing climate, to biodiversity loss, to whatever species went extinct, you know, that's unfair. Uh, but I don't know that I'm making that connection. Clearly, that's outside of my expertise. Um, a lot of times what's used in projections of future climate is doubling of pre-industrial CO2. So doubling not of what we have right now for 10 ppm, but of 280, which we think is what happened before the industrial revolution that um, put all the fossil fuel CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, so we're, we're kind of getting close to that. Um, we're at 410. When I started, when I finished college, it was about 380. So you can see the change. But... Um, I think the irreversible changes will have to be defined because even sea level rise, is that irreversible? There's a lot of interannual variability, even like with ozone, we saw ozone goes down, uh, goes up, you know, maybe uh, there's other phenomena like El Nino that will make one year hotter than, than it would be otherwise with just climate change or with just other variables. So it's really hard to tell. It's, it's, you know, chaotic system, literally, and um, it, it's hard to tell. But in terms of irreversible changes, I think that might actually just be also outside of my scope. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do deal in climate, but not that broadly. Okay, thank you, Monica. I will just read another big thank you for you from Anna Kaczynska. Uh, there is a big thank you for the interesting lecture and best regards to you. And as you can see in chat also, Bernadette is sending her great uh, thank you. And uh, she's really proud to be your former teacher. Uh, so in Polish, uh, dziękuję pani doktor, świetny wykład, jestem dumna, uh, też jako dawna nauczycielka, gratuluję serdecznie, pozdrawiam, życzę dużo dobrego. So that's, these are those greetings from the teachers who used to teach you in the past. I'm really so happy that we could also stay in touch, Monika, basically, but I will also read that there is also a message from Łukasz. Thank you for the amazing lecture and I'm very happy with my newly gained knowledge. So Monika, that was a great, uh, the, well, great pleasure to have you here. But I have one last question, if you don't mind. I, I'm, sure. I'm really interested in science myself. Um, well, what about other greenhouse gases? Because we talk very often, you, you mentioned those, obviously, but other, uh, you know, when when we, we do we recalculate, well, we do recalculate very often to CO2 levels, right? So that's, that's or it's not the case, basically, when we deal with atmospheric, and when we talk about greenhouse effect, probably we do. But then other, uh, 
do we have to worry about other greenhouse gases other than CO2 that probably will you know cause some problems in the future that we see already the increase of I mean yeah yeah, for sure. In fact, it's both uh, we worry and then we see solutions in them as well, right? Because sometimes CO2, it seems like such an insurmountable problem. Anything you burn, you produce CO2. But you don't have to produce other things like methane, right? And you don't want to lose methane. Methane costs money. You could burn it in, 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 um, in a stove and, and, and make it uh, into well, more CO2. But at least this methane doesn't have to be in the atmosphere. So um, like all the oil and gas production, no one wants to leak methane, they can sell methane. So um, those are other greenhouse gases. There's also other, um, like there's SF6, um, sulfur um, hexafluoride. Um, so that's an extremely strong greenhouse gas. It's like 2000 times more potent than CO2, but it's smaller. So do we worry? Not clear. There's nitrous oxide, N2O. That's a uh, pretty strong greenhouse gases. It's increasing like crazy. And it's also ozone depleting substance. So in the stratosphere, again, another problem that we're obviously trying to fix as well. So maybe we, we target that one. It's part of extremely complicated nitrogen cycle. So we do worry about that. Um, but maybe it's again, uh, a easier fix because it comes from agriculture, contain industry. We can maybe address it better. I don't think anyone wants to necessarily release uh, nitrous oxide. So. Uh, I think the other greenhouse gases are more potent. Even methane is more potent than, than uh, over greenhouse gas than CO2, but they're smaller, and, but they're potentially uh, a solution to, uh, at least in the short term. Uh, that's why I think now methane is getting a lot of attention because uh, we know how to contain methane more than we know how to deal with CO2 being released. So even though it's uh, it's not a problem, maybe, but also it's it's a easier solution potentially. And especially methane is also uh, an intermediate to some air pollution problems. So um, we don't want methane for those purposes either to cause more air pollution. So uh, I think it's both. But one thing I'll say is that NOAA produces um, not just a report on, on CO2 levels, but it, com it has this annual greenhouse gas index. And that's when it really aggregates everything. So there's a number that we track that's not just CO2, but all the greenhouse gases together. And we can see how that's um, that's uh, really uh, affecting the atmosphere. Because, you know, atmosphere doesn't care. Um, just something that absorbs the radiation. So it, it is useful to look at this uh, whole aggregate uh, greenhouse gas index. And that's another product that NOAA provides to everyone, to the public. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, it's new knowledge, really. So I learned something really interesting uh, from this lecture and from this this answer to my question. Uh, well, what we can do at the moment is just to. Oh, there is there's one other question. Just as literally this is the last question. Uh, Anna is say is writing. You're saying we worry about X or Y. Uh, does the research that you do affect your emotional or mental health? Is the climate panic sort of occupational hazard? in your line of work i don't think ah we get that all the time yeah you know yeah. it's interesting because i work with air pollution more so there is a more positive picture there like there's some su serious success stories in air pollution so i don't know if that balances things out i mean every four years i go to the international conference on carbon dioxide international carbon dioxide conference i do cd uh icdc and yeah you see the data it's pretty scary um like it just doesn't go down or like the last uh, few years ago there was a um in 2016 there was a huge increase in co2 and apparently the cause is because the biosphere didn't take up co2 I mean, the global biosphere gave up i mean that's, that's some scary things you know it's real data it's not opinion i mean just see the the raw data it's kind of scary but yeah i mean definitely working with air pollution even though yeah air pollution we know it can harm our health but at least there's some serious hope there um because we see success stories and i feel like that that definitely definitely helps but yeah i realize uh climate scientists get that question all the time so yeah. <laughs> <it's not here. laughs> all right thank you thank you monica and thank you for your questions uh let's wrap it up really i mean it's been very interesting lecture and uh that's really the uh the first of this, of this new edition of our A plus lectures delivered by world class uh, specialist and uh, monica 
thank you for coming. Thank you for accepting the invitation. And let me invite everyone else to our next uh, lecture. But I mean, this this will be announced uh, in due time. So keep you will uh, keep up with the messages that we are sending and obviously also visit our website www.apsl.edu.pl thank you our facebook accounts as well of pomeranian university in swoopsk and uh, monica again thank you very very much for just delivering the lecture for accepting the invitation the uh, this has worked well and i hope uh, everybody else have already in, ha have also enjoyed this uh, lecture and our meeting today. So thank you very much, Marek. Dziękuję bardzo. And I do mean that when I put my email address, if anyone has any questions or, or would like to find out more, definitely please get in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye then. Do widzenia Państwu. Dziękujemy serdecznie i zapraszamy na kolejne wydarzenie serii wykłady na 5 plus w ramach naszej Akademii Aktywnej. Do widzenia Państwu.